Okay, this is kind of a tricky one. Selective coordination. Um, have you ever had an incident where you had a, a fault, where perhaps a 20 amp breaker should have been the one to trip, and instead an upstream breaker tripped and you lost the entire panel? Uh, I know that happened to me, and I'm not going to tell you how the fault happened, but uh, a 20 amp circuit should have definitely tripped. Uh, and it didn't. Instead, the 800 amp main outside tripped and we lost power to the entire building. Uh, that is an example of not having selective coordination. Okay, so selective coordination or coordination comma selective is defined as localizing an overcurrent condition to restrict outages only to the equipment affected. Selective coordination includes all currents, including faults and overloads, for the entire range of opening time of the device. Okay, so here in my little childlike drawings here, and I apologize, I'm not a better artist. I have the main here. Let's say it's got a, a 1200 amp main breaker. And with a 400 amp breaker, it feeds this panel. And then maybe with a 50 amp breaker, it feeds this panel. Now we have a fault here on this 50 amp circuit. So phase to phase fault, the black and red smack into each other and it generates 5,000 amps. Now, will a 5,000 amp uh, overcurrent open a 50 amp overcurrent device? Yeah, of course. Will it open a uh, 400 amp overcurrent device? Sure. Would it open an 800 amp overcurrent device? You bet, yeah. The only question is, which will it open soonest? Because it could potentially open any or all three of them. When we selectively coordinate, we look at the characteristics of the circuit breakers or fuses, and we ensure that with the available fault current, it only opens the breaker or fuse closest to the fault. So if this is selectively coordinated, the only breaker that would trip if I have a fault on this feeder is the 50 amp breaker supplying the feeder circuit. Now selective coordination uh, is always a, a good goal in a design, right? For obvious reasons. If you have a fault, you only want to lose as little as possible. You know, if it wasn't selectively coordinated, then the 1200 amp main up here could open and we could lose the entire building. So certainly you want to selectively coordinate when you can, although sometimes it, it may be more difficult than it's potentially worth. Now, there are times in the code where we're required to selectively coordinate. You know, if I lose power to the entire building and it's just a little shoe store in the mall or something, well, who cares? <laughs> you know, it really doesn't make that big of a deal. Maybe to the owner of the building it sucks, but for a, a life safety perspective, it might not be that big of an issue. Um, if we have a high-rise building and it has an emergency system with emergency lights, exit signs, fire pumps, smoke control systems, elevator recall, things like that. Um, boy, if we had a fault on one emergency light and it took out the emergency generator, obviously that's unacceptable. That can't happen. So we do have some requirements in the NEC where we have to have selective coordination. 700.31 for uh, emergency systems, 700.32 for legally required standby systems, and I think it's 620.60, if I'm not mistaken, for, uh, for elevators under certain conditions. You've also got something in uh, 708 for critical operation systems. Um, you also kind of have something in 517 for healthcare facilities. Although in 517.26, it actually kind of alters this definition. And it says, hey, for hospitals, for, for the essential electrical system, the critical branch and the life safety branch, they have to comply with Article 700, except they require selective coordination only down to 0 0.1 seconds. Whereas in a normal facility that has selective coordination, it goes what? For the entire range of opening times of the device. So the emergency system in a commercial building has more stringent requirements than the life safety system of a hospital, believe it or not. Kind of strange as far as that goes. Now, when we talk about selectively coordin uh, coordinated systems, how do we make sure that the system is going to coordinate? Well. That's a pretty lengthy process, and it requires you to have the time current characteristic curves of your overcurrent devices, your circuit breakers or fuses, 
and you you basically you, you get transparencies of them and you can lay them on top of each other and see if they overlap at the given available fault current uh, there's there's uh, software that can help you do it and a, a coordination study is is usually a very involved process now I'm not going to spend two hours talking about selective coordination. This is just the definitions. Uh, but if you want to take a deep dive, if you really want to go down the rabbit hole and, and learn about selective coordination, I'm going to make a recommendation for you. Go to my friend Thomas Dimitrovich's page on YouTube. Click on his page. Search videos for selective coordination. Um, he's an engineer for Eaton, so he, he not only has the engineering background and knowledge, but he knows the products as well as anybody in the industry, circuit breakers and fuses. So uh, if you're interested in selective coordination, I think it's going to be time well spent if you cruise over to Tom's uh, YouTube page. Uh, so with that said, that's all. That's the, as far as I'm going to go on selective coordination because we're just talking about the definitions. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and ring the bell.